Hello and welcome to everyone on the line. I can see a number of people joining the call now. Um, welcome and uh, very excited to uh, to run the next instalment of the Security Middle East magazine's webinars. I've got a, a stellar panel of speakers joining us today to explore some of the innovation uh, solutions around uh, data center protection um, through advanced security camera systems, access controls, and robust monitoring capabilities. The first individual that I'd like to introduce is Joseph Farage, who is the CEO and founder at Progress Security Systems. He is a leader in the integrated security solutions space with over 20 years of experience in the security industry. He's developed extensive expertise in strategic solution design, um, technology integration, and client management. And joining Joseph is Stuart Bettel, who has been with uh, JCI for the past 21 years and the integrator prior to that. Again, extensive experience and background in the security industry with a, a bunch of knowledge um, around end user integration. Um, joining Stuart is Raphael Shrivers, who again, 20 plus years of uh, experience in the, in the field of security, been involved in a bunch of different developmental and launches of new access control products. And I believe the, the blend of these three individuals will provide the audience with a very interesting webinar around uh, data center protection and security. Now, without uh, spending too much time on the introductions, if anyone has any questions, please do add them to the question panel at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will endeavor to answer them towards the end of the question, um, the end of the session, should I say. But uh, Mr. Farage, more than happy to hand over to yourself, over to you gentlemen. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our webinar today. I am Joseph Farage, CEO and founder of Progress Security System. I would like to start by thanking Security Middle East for hosting this webinar and our partner at Johnson Control to join us. And a warm welcome to all of you for making time to join us today. Founded 14 years ago, Progress has grown to become a leader provider of customized security solutions. Our vision is to deliver projects that meet each client unique needs through innovative solution driven integration. This would not be possible without our dedicated security expert. Our project managers and engineers have extensive experience across various industries and always stay up to date with the latest trends through ongoing training. For every client, our tailored approach ensures complete control and confidence from initial consultation through post-project support. We leverage the most current technologies and methodologies to develop our future-proof solution responsive to their specific requirements and priorities. Strategic partnerships like the one with Johnson Control are always invaluable. They provide industry-leading resources and technologies that combine with our integration expertise deliver optimized results for our mature clients. Quality and reliability are central to our operation. ISO and regulatory certification reinforce our commitment as does continuous process improvement based on customer feedback. One of the success story for our data center project integration in Dubai is for one of the largest telecommunication provider in UAE. We geographically dispersed data center footprint we were requested by the client to enhance their physical and logical security integration. We faced major technical challenges during the integration on their data center in terms of infrastructure, which required major upgrades and different systems, which caused monitoring, management, and efficiencies. Our team was able to customize the necessary solution within outlined budget and ahead of schedule. While streamlined many separate facilities into a unified platform, with minimal disruption to critical operation. 
We efficiently delivered with the project with annual cost saving, actionable insight, and automated workflow. Ultimately, we aim to strategically support our client security and business objective now and into the future. Emerging technologies remain a focus, so we stay prepared to enable their security growth. It's now my pleasure to hand over to our partner, John Fund Control, who will showcase some of their latest data center security innovations. Thank you for your attention. I will be happy to take any question you may have at the end of John Fund Control presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. We, we could advance to the next slide. This webinar is regarding data centers. Now, data centers is a huge topic. We could talk about this all day, tomorrow, and the rest of the week. So between myself and Raf, we're going to choose certain specific subjects within our presentation. In reality, to highlight certain points, look at what is available now as solutions, what will be available in the future, what our philosophy is in this future. Uh, but also really just to generate questions in your own mind, because data centers, as I say, is a huge topic. They're all different. They all have their certain challenges. But if we start to look at some little common threads of these challenges, this is what you're seeing on the screen at the moment. Cybersecurity is a topic that is always at the forefront of everybody's mind, and particularly for data centers and their let's say peer group uh, businesses, which I would class as anything that is critical infrastructure, because they are classic targets for people who have less than generous needs to uh, attack them to either, you know, for uh, business purposes, for fun even. And that is why we will be talking a little bit about cyber, a little bit also about these other things such as system management today, because if you don't manage a system correctly, how can you have a good security system? Therefore, how do we build in features and functions to help this system management? Also other things like this, the high availability, which is key. So we'll be, we'll be touching on these topics as we go through. If we go to the next slide, there is a very, brief uh, case study. And this is around the data center in Latin America. It, it was just, uh, shall we say, one of our examples. But I use this because the challenge is there, this um, multiple layer of security, this need for cyber security, and therefore having very strong cyber secure products for their security, such as the access in the video. It actually backs up what I've just been talking about on the previous slide. So overall, we'll be touching on you know, some of the ideas, some of the feature sets that help data centers and the equivalents protect their staff, the data, their customers' data. And that is key as well, because data centers are classed as critical infrastructure because they are hosting information potentially from, let's say, banks and things. So there not only has to be this very robust uh, strategy for security in place, but there also needs to be this robust protection of the data that's held there because other organizations, some of which are equally critical, are relying on data centers. So the reputation of a data center is also key to this philosophy around how the, you know, it is kept secure. Now, the word I wish to um, pick up there is, or two words, in fact, is multiple layers. Because if we go to the next slide, this is how we at JCI, RAF, myself, look at how we start to help and advise with the security of data centers. And we look at it, it is like an onion. The onion has multiple layers, and if you cut, you can see all of these. And the need for security within data center is equally, let's say, that complex, that layered. So we'll be talking about some of these layers today, just touching on some of the, uh, the topics, because ultimately different layers like the perimeter, like the 
let's say number four, the higher risk areas, which is probably where you're actually holding the data. That's where all of the, the cloud devices are. They require different approaches. It certainly is not a one size fits all uh, philosophy or mentality. And each of these layers is specific to the individual data center because particularly around perimeters, they could be big, they could be small, they could be next to another building, they could be joined to another building. And so all of these aspects need to be given this thought. So when coming up with this presentation, but also when talking to such customers, this is sort of the approach we look at as firstly, you know, how do you protect your perimeter? How do you manage people coming into, going out, how uh, the building, how do you audit trail that? How do you ensure that your security solutions are working? And all of those things. So these will be touching on a little bit, but let's start with perimeter on the next slide. And perimeter, as I say, the requirement really depends upon the actual site itself because some are big, some are small. Some are isolated, some are very innocuous in, uh, let's say, industrial uh, centers and things. So all of this protection around the perimeter is very unique. However, there are commonalities in the technology that can be used. I mean, it obviously can be cameras, it can be gate physical fences and things. Let's not forget those types of controlling a perimeter as well. It is not just about logical solutions and so on. It equally can be about physical things to prevent or give early warning that somebody is approaching or somebody has breached the perimeter and can now potentially get to the actual physical building itself. So we'll be touching on some of these. And the first actually one I'll be touching on is this automation and AI, because certainly in the past number of years, there has been huge advancements in technology, both within the access to video and so on. And that technology can be leveraged to provide early um, situational awareness of the, a potential uh, breach or potential problem is about to happen. But equally, it can be used in workflows and to access data quickly uh, when, let's say, reviewing video or reviewing logs of what has been happening on the system. So we will touch on that first. So if we start to move to slide 13, this, I think it's 13, this is where I hand over to Raf for a moment. Yeah, also part of the perimeter security. Thank you, Stuart. And indeed, you can close your building, your facility, you can make it uh, well, physically impossible to enter, detect wherever uh, you are possible if somebody comes to the facility and, and making sure that they are not in or typically in a data center and typically in a building. We need people to enter, uh, we, but we need to monitor that. And then, if, and in uh, certain cases, there are also vehicles that come to the site that needs to uh, load or unload stuff. But we need to manage that in an easy way. Uh, doing a vehicle uh, control uh, for employees or visitors with the NPR cameras, something like that. Is it 100%? No, it's 100% but it is already a first layer of security that you can build in. You can do that also with long range uh, tags uh, fixed on cars. There are also mechanisms now where you can do the two factor authentication. That means the person and the vehicle together can enter and exit into the certain areas. Access control at the gate, the authentication at the gate. Um, before they come on the facility, they come before they are entering to the first layer, uh, like uh, Stuart described, you can check these with, uh, if, do, it, do they have the access right? Do they have a, a, a QR code, for example, with an invitation that they are allowed to be at that time at that site? So you can build in a lot of possibilities there. And then also enforcing health checks before people entering in the campus of facility or construction site, for example. Do they have the work permission? Do they have a health and safety check? Did they follow the, uh, the trainings 
before entering into a data center. You, you can have and do that all with document checkings at the gate itself. So um, that's also a, a possibility to protect that uh, area. And then the next slide, um, Stuart will go further. And I think one thing that Raf asked a question and answered it himself there, is, is anything 100%? And the answer is no. So this is why to have these layers and use various technologies is important, because as the more technology you use, the more layers you have, this reduces the risk. This reduces that um, capability of one, uh, let's say, layer might fail, but actually then the others shall we say, will add that additional level of protection. Now, using the latest technology is always important because, as I said, there's been huge advancements uh, over the past years and particularly in the video side. So over these next couple of slides or so, I'll be talking about actually using AI. Now, call it automated intelligence, which is what I prefer to call it, or if you wish, artificial intelligence doesn't matter. But what it is about is adding this extra capability to let operators work on something else, focus on something else, and actually let the intelligence do this first layer of protection to give this additional situational awareness. It's not about saying, ah, AI will, in video, will replace all operators. No, it won't. What it will do is start to give this early warning. It will start to give the right information to the right person at the right time so they ultimately can do their job. So we'll look at some examples. Let's, if, if we move to the next slide. So we all know what PTZ cameras are. There we, we've seen them for many, many years. And the benefit is that when I can run AI, and I'm going to be talking edge AI, so AI that runs on the camera, be it the PTZ, be it fixed cameras, then I can start to use this intelligence in conjunction with the pan, tilt, and zoom, or just static cameras, to, as a first example, look at my perimeters. So this could be huge distances. As I mentioned, uh, data centers can be from various different areas and styles and everything else. And therefore, this flexibility to use the AI, there you see somebody on screen, they are uh, in the car park. It has picked them up. You can just probably see the little red box around the person. I'm expecting cars, but I'm not expecting a person. Or maybe it's people at a specific time of day. That's not normal. So AI allows me to filter out what is normal, what I'm expecting, and what is not. And that is the key about this. Filter away what I'm not interested in. Just let me focus on what I am interested in, because that could be the first indication of a security breach. If we look at the next slide, then this actually probably shows a little bit more of the AI in action. So you can see here, car, truck. You can actually see the person in the, the blue van there. And this is just an example of AI understanding what a person is, what a truck is, what a car is. You can even see the color icons above the vehicles. You can just see it now, the blue, there you go. So this starts to enable me, particularly on things like searches, to filter information to say, ah, I need to know when that blue car or blue van came on site, or a person wearing a blue um, shirt in this case, blue upper half of clothing. So AI here is enabling me to really, as I say, filter information. Previously, everybody's had to look at every piece of information, and that makes people glaze over. They get bored. And then they miss things. AI doesn't get bored at all. And as long as it is what I will call quality AI, then it doesn't miss things either. So not only is this about filtering, but it's also about quality of information. That is key. And we'll look at that on the next slide here, please. And here is just a couple of examples. 
So in the first example, if you click, what you will see is this is a, an image at night. This is through infrared. But yet you can still see the people being picked up, even though they are only probably 10 percent of screen height right at the back there. So it's not just about using any AI. It's using quality because quality of information is key for those who are in the IT garbage in garbage out and it's no different from an ai perspective if we, if we click for the next uh, image there you go it's a it's a barrier that could be the barrier to a data center but i bet you didn't spot the person there you can see them there it says person it, it's even hard for me to see on screen now but the ai picked it up even though they are obscured by a barrier so here my my message is even when considering all of these layers always consider the quality of the information being generated and proof of concept. Things like this are always very good mantras to have when particularly looking at security for data centers. Okay, I'm going to hand you back to Raf for a few minutes. Yeah, for the, the next slide, um, mm. stay on top of threats. That's, that's you know, you know nothing is 100%, but stay on top of the threats. The importance is to stay on top of the threats. This is only possible when you have an holistic security view uh, about the infrastructure itself. Define clear how to assess employees, subcontractors, and visitors that are coming on site. To do this, it is important to have a large, the large picture, physical, logical, and cyber security converged all in one. On the next slide and, and the following slides, we will go through different steps, how to do that from, a, I would say, from a holistic view. And um, typically, yeah, you can manage visitors and subcontractors efficient. Well, if you have one in the same database, um, pre-registration to a web portal for, for visitor hosts that can invite visitors to the site, know who invites who from when till when. Also know, making sure that the receptionist or the security officer knows exactly how many people are coming to the site at a certain day or a certain part of the day. Also when the visitor come on site to have an immediately clear view do they have the IDs with them? Do they have an invitation with a QR code? Can we scan that, automate that? Does the it also include um, when you send out an invitation to visitors, um, it, having immediately a document delivered with it, with the health and safety instructions, where to park, how to behave, what to wear on the, on, on the site. We can have that with an automated email facilities. So, there is also some, of course, when uh, some visitors or subcontractors come inside to doing a self check in kiosk to make it quicker, efficient, but register, register all the, the, the movements of people and the behavior of people in the area. And they have that also as an enhanced reporting um, on, on that. That's important that we keep track of that. On the next slide, please. Holistic view uh, security is about the infrastructure. In one overview, know who is where uh, at your site is an important one. With one click, you have to see how many people are there, how many people are in the different layers, the first layer, the second layer, and how who who and how many people are in the critical area in, uh, part of that data center. It is important to have that view that you know the people behavior, the building behavior, and that together gives you a lot of interesting data and for reporting. In the next slide, we go a bit further. You remember the layered approach, the fourth layer, cage, the cabinets, the racks, and uh, what is typically very present in a data center? Well, data center racks, how do you protect them? Um, with uh, wireless locks? I don't think so because something that data centers don't like are wireless communication inside that uh, inside these environments. But we have to monitor and manage that in a decent way. And with one controller, you can manage uh, up to sixteen cabinets back and uh, back and front. Uh, present a card, 
possibility if access rights are there, open the, the rack. But you have to complete status of the direct door is open, closed, uh, who entered from when till when. So you have a complete overview about that. Just with one controller, you can manage these 16 cabinets back and front. Um, you can use also the multi-factor authentication, put rules in there to, for access specific areas. Um, secure transmission, of course, it's a no-brainer. It has to be encrypted from card till server uh, and using uh, multi-factor authentication where possible. And that you see in the next slide, um, the, this slide is showing, you know, <laughs> facial recognition can be convenient. But in this case, it is different. It is about enhancing the security, increasing the security for that high secured areas. Because you know, card is what you have. A pin code is what you know. But does that mean the people that have the card is really the person that is intended to be there? No. With Multi-factor authentication, you increase or you go more for the absolute security. With facial uh, facial recognition to, in combination with card or other things, you can have a near that absolute security um, and know exactly who is here, who entered uh, who, or who is in certain areas in the data center. So go for multi-factor authentication. There are multiple ways of doing that. Facial is one, iris recognition is another one. You have also the hand wave or the vein recognition that are the nowadays technology, let's touchless, uh, or I would say touchless facial recognition or touchless biometric reader is, 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 is key in these areas. We can go to the next slide. And that's Stuart who goes a bit more so, into the efficiency. Yeah, we've been looking at the staying on top of threats in Raf's previous section. You know, the looking at particular the layers of security required. But in reality, none of this is any good unless there is some efficiency. So if we go to the next slide, let me um, describe what I mean by efficiency. Now, this starts at the user experience. This is the, the software, the client, let's call it, that the operator needs to use. And ultimately, you can see here, scope of autonomous security and so on. Once a potential threat has been detected and analyzed, this is a journey. And this is where having a robust partner for the uh, security software really comes into play. And this also gives you an indication as where as we as a manufacturer are moving forward because the more we can bring efficiency into this detection analysis, create this investigation and so on, you can see it on screen, the quicker events will be dealt with. So if we move to the next slide, then we can just drill down a little bit here. Huge security operating centers in reality are a thing, a little thing of a bit of the past because as products are more integrated as let's say from our instance you know our intrusion our video our fire our access control our cct are all brought together this allows for this you know, workflow and in conclude uh, in conjunction rather with the let's say the ai so where a potential threat is detected let's use the perimeter again and somebody breaching the perimeter fence this can set a chain in place, which can you know, be pop-ups and maps and so on, but equally it can be things like, oh, we need to lock certain doors, just as an example, to change the way the security is being operated in the building. But the key is how the information is brought to the operator. And it goes back for me to that situational awareness, because the more I can automate this, the more I can use the operator as the driver to manage this information be, be that so let's say the second pair of eyes the first can be the system itself on a situation then the better that situation is dealt with the quicker it is dealt with and i can get my responders out to try and apprehend the person who's breaching or a person who is in the wrong area of the building somebody who's managed to get into the layer four into the the actual rack area 
this is what is, is ultimately key. So if we move to the next slide, which I, I give to Raf. Yeah, uh, in, indeed. Um, thank you, Stuart. And we spoke about, yeah, how to stay on top of threats and certainly progress uh, together with technologies that we provide, certainly able to provide you that, uh, I would say this protection in the different layers. Uh, and what we add to that, and that's really where we are, you know, access control and video exists since, since many years. And also the combination of the two exists many years, but where, and, and you see that already in the slides, where we're going to is actually making, with all the data that we have, making the systems more intelligent. We know how things are behave in terms of access control. Uh, we're building in alarm intelligence, that means we, we can see what happens in the system over time and build on our knowledge on that, making decisions for the operators easy. For example, somebody entered into the high secured area, heart of the data center over day. You would say, yeah, there's no problem. Indeed, when the same person comes in at two midnight at that door, normally there is nothing, should be not a problem. Yes, there is a problem. What is that person doing at that night? It is the same type of access in, or entry into certain areas, but with a different time zone. What does that mean for it? If somebody enters into the door or try to enter into the door, present his card, enter the PIN code, he does that two or three times. What does that mean? The person forgot his, his, his PIN code, raise that more as an important alarm. If somebody present the card and open the door, um, uh, when we, we look into the whole perspective of that, when it happens, uh, with who it happens. If there are people over time entering more through the back door than the front door, what does that mean? Is there a problem with the front door? Is there something happening on the back door? Is it easier to enter into certain areas? Is it easier to tailgate uh, with, with people into the, into the area? All that kind of intelligence we build into our access control platform, making sure that we are filtering or prioritize the alarms that needs to be handled for the operator and also getting a faster identification of the real threats and make opera these operations actually more efficient. And Stuart will go a bit further in that as well. Oh, that's, I think that's my slide as well. I apologize for that. <laughs> so, well, all these slides. So what we are doing is improving efficiency, making the situational awareness better, design the system proactively designed to be reactive as well. That means when something happened in a few clicks, you find the whole story of what happened, the action and the reactions that came to it. Also designed for cybersecurity, which is key. We mentioned that in the beginning, it, it's a no brainer. Cybersecurity, and I will mention that in the next slide as well, but it is going from, from, from the development till the installation and the use of a security system. It is designed for, designed for deeper integrations, high availability, giving the possibilities to do a, a really deep reporting because we have typically a lot of information about people behavior and the building behavior. And it needs to be scalable, scalable architecture, of course, we are growing with our end users. We can start with a, a few doors protection with a few cameras to protect the site, but we give that scalability to monitor not only one facility, uh, but also monitor multiple facilities with one uh, in one overview. The next slide, please. Now, or there's lots there. of, shall we say, good subjects that we could talk forever on. Um, when we do, uh, that we've covered already. But there are some other key ones that we've just touched on predominantly in the previous slide that we just want to drill down a little bit on because they are important. So if we look at the next slide, and it sounds like an obvious thing, but high availability is key in critical infrastructure such as data centers and things, such as using RAID for the recording of video dual power supplies on the recorders because you know one of the vulnerabilities of a recorder 
is the power supply because of the heat that it generates. Also things like, um, you see the little video looping in the top right. If the camera loses communications to the recorder, the camera can record to itself. That's nothing new, but the fact is the backfill onto the recorder to fill in the gap whilst there was that loss of communication is vital because it goes back to that user experience. All the information is in one place. You're not having to try and retrieve something from a data card in a um, in a camera. But equally things like, and it's very rarely thought about, cameras that are critical, maybe on the perimeter and things, that are dual powered, let's say through PoE and low voltage, because if one method stops, the other method kicks in. There are a number of these little nuances that I think always should be thought about with this level of customer, because this is what helps protect the protection system. And if we jump to the next slide, it's not just about physical things that I've been mentioning here. It's also about how do I keep things up to date? How do I manage multiple sites, perhaps dispersed systems? So having within the actual software itself, the client software, the capability, let's say, to monitor the camera firmware and update the camera firmware, centralize the actual user database of the system instead of having that um, it regionalized, which is then very difficult to maintain, the updating of the firmwares of the recorders and things, all of these things are key, including things like enhanced security. What ports are open? What can I lock down? How do I rotate passwords? How do I make passwords huge? Now, for us, these are all intrinsic within our software capabilities. But I think these are always questions that sometimes get overlooked, but always should be thought about. People focus on these layers, but actually there is a fifth layer, which is how do I protect and manage the actual systems themselves? And that is always a question to ask. If we run back to RAF, and then RAF will take this a little further. Yeah, indeed. Uh, increased compliance, equality, security, that's that's that that's where it is all about, right? And more than ever, security systems do more than security. And we are not the only system that use personal identifiable inf user information. We link with other personal databases, HR databases, using standard protocols like uh, uh, the LDAP, for example, Active Directory. Could access control systems have to include? And this is just a small list of, of functionalities and features that are needed or solutions. But uh, our solutions also offer the communication service plugins to communicate to employees or subcontractors about their work permissions, security or safety risk, or when a security update training is uh, required, multi-day check. Does this employee or, or subcontractor did follow the health and safety training? Did he have the work permission? Check multiple dates. And if something happens, okay, for certain areas, the permission runs out and we're not giving this person access to it until he fo uh, followed the rules or followed the training. Nevertheless, the typical access control features are still key to automate functionalities, maintain disciplines to occupants and to ensure safe, uh, safety and security, not to leave anything to a chance to go wrong in your safe and security. Also, a good business intelligent reporting system helped to measure the behavior and the performance of the building and the occupants, but also important security levels that you put in place there. In the next slide, uh, it is about cybersecurity again. And that's also to show here um, how we harden or devices that are in uh, on the network and typically um, we harden the hardware. That's 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 key for us. And that begins in the very beginning. The, when we buy components, we make sure that these components are safe and secure to be used. We have separate, dedicated cyber and security teams that monitor our engineering and and development teams. And if there's something that is or could be a potential breach or backdoor, they say like fix it first, and then we release. So it is a permanently and to continuous development 
and checking the cybersecurity side of our products, hardware, firmware, and software. And we um, we 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 do that very you know very strict. There's no product that leaves our manufacturing without cybersecurity signs it off. Zero trust identification is where we want to go. In the next slides, we show a few of, I would say, typically where access control controllers have to um, have to comply to TLS 1.3 key, the AES 256 encryption, all these. And, and you speak with IT managers, they know immediately what that means. Perhaps security officers are a bit like, oh, what are all these abbreviations? This is what is needed if you put a controller on a network, making sure that your uh, uh, your hardware that you put on your network is safe and secure, complying with all the regulations and all the certifications that are needed. In the next slides, I want to show also a very important part of an access control security system in general. It is about open standards, open and available making sure also the equipment that is interacting good from with the different uh, systems mqtt it's a it's a new uh, nowadays it's not new but it nowadays in uh, in security <clears throat> comes in as an open standard <clears throat> excuse me of protocol between controllers and controllers and hosts osdp the open standard for reader to uh, to controller uh, communication offline locking systems with OSS open standards. We as a company use as much as possible open standards to communicate and to interact with other systems because we don't want to tie you in into certain ecosystems. No, we are open and that's key for us uh, going forward. A backnet to communicate with building management systems, or if it's not possible with open standards, or they are not there, the open standards to communicate with other systems, we have open APIs available, making sure that we can make customized integrations and deep data management uh, to different multiple points on that. And all of that uh, in the next slide, Stuart will give you a, a summary of what we spoke about. Here is, I don't read the slides to you, you can see them yourself, but what we've set out to achieve in this short presentation is in reality just to give you a view of where we are as a manufacturer, where we are going, the types of philosophies that we have, everything from how systems are managed, how our very stringent cybersecurity program works. And but mainly to actually put generate questions in your own mind, because hopefully once you know you're looking at similar customers um, in the future, you start to think you know about these layers. How can I use the latest in technology to you know give me early warning? Perhaps how can I use the software for ultimately making things more efficient? on site? How do I look at high availability? What functions are in the products I am looking at to ensure that high availability? So there are a lot of, and I, to be honest, I like presentations that create more questions than answer them, because I think that is the, the right outcome of a presentation. And in that, that is what Raf and I have been looking at today. So from our perspective, we say thank you very much for your time. I think we have a few minutes for any questions and answers that might have been uh, um, written into the chat. So let's hand back over to, uh, I think, I believe, Daniel to see what we have there. And thank you again. Thank you uh, very much to all three of you for the uh, the very detailed presentation. I think we've covered quite a lot there. I know, Stuart, you alluded to the fact that you, you could talk about this particular topic for, for hours, days even. Um, but uh, I can see in the chat there's a fair amount of, of questions that have rolled in, and I'll try and summarize some of them to maybe kill two birds with one stone. Um, but I'd like to start with more of a, you know, a generic question, which is what are, you know, some of the, the top security challenges that you typically see 
with organizations that you work with and how how has integrated solutions helped address those specific challenges so stuart raf what are your thoughts i think i think that's a very detailed question which <laughs> yeah i could have a very detailed response but i uh, and raf will build on this but i think ultimately the the key is the operator because with the right user experience then uh, you manage to keep people's attention. And if you keep people's attention, then actually they're doing their function efficiently. So by bringing products together, then actually you're not making people have to learn the multiple systems. You're keeping everything in front of them instead of having to jump around. And I would say from my perspective, that is the key point there. Raf, would you add to that? Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right, and uh, and I I want to add something on it. Actually, before you we were talking about the product, we are about to integrate the solutions. And yes, the key is how deep and how good this integration is. But even and then there's a third element in that is your integrator that work with you that doing and the going through the steps, how to stay ahead of security breaches and finding and designing the system for your needs is, is a very important part. And together with progress, we'll make sure that that happens. And that, that's the very key part. I don't want to, um, yeah, in, in, in phase on, on, on that one as well. Okay, fair enough. And um, I'm just looking at some of the audience members here and there's probably a, um, a a blend of you know levels of maturity and um, you know different organisations on their journey when it comes to to data centres. Now, my question is: Do you have any specific challenges that spring to mind, or experiences that you've encountered when integrating new security technologies into existing data centre infrastructures? And what recommendations do you have for overcoming them? I, I think a, a security system needs to be kept up to date permanently. And and also it is good to make some critical assessments uh, on a frequently basis. Like um, a building is evolving, you know, you're going, um, there are new technologies coming in the IT world. There are new uh, uh, software platforms that are attached to, to the operations of buildings. Um, you have to monitor permanently, is the system up to date? And do we have the integrations that are needed to make or to keep our holistic view about uh, uh, and the situational awareness uh, uh, of, of the infrastructure? So it's something that you don't do every five years. No, it has to be done on a, on a regular basis to make sure that you stay on top of the threats that, that that's key in that. And what we see, and typically with all uh, the, the access control equipment that we have, when we in, install these equipment, it's not just for a few days or a few, few years, for example. It is for multiple years, decennias uh, long. And we don't leave any customer behind. When we develop a, a controller, install a controller, we have the so software platforms that manage that. We keep them up to date but making sure also that we take our customers with us in the whole uh, experiences, making sure that controllers that are developed 20 years ago are still compatible with the newest software, taking into account, of course, cybersecurity, which is an important part. Hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And um, I think a question maybe for Joseph here is, if we look at the, you know, the maturity curve and organizations towards the upper sort of higher end of the maturity curve and they're they're you know they've got a fairly mature data center they've got security integrated but they want to move to the next step if we come to the beginning of that curve and we look at you know organizations that are embarking on this this you know digital transformation journey what would you recommend as the first steps to starting this process because you've mentioned quite a lot of areas of security you know car recognition facial technologies, building management, where does an organization start to you know, embark on this type of journey? 
definitely what we'd like to start is conduct a security assessment that will begin with a throughout evaluation of the current security measure, identifying the vulnerability gap and area of improvement. This assessment should be include both the physical and the cyber element. Uh, second is to define the objective and requirement, clearly outline the security goal which you wish to achieve. Consider factors such as compliance need, risk tolerance, uh, specific threats, and relevant to your organization. Uh, third one, we do a research and benchmarking, investigate the best practice in, uh, in industry standard relevant to the sector, benchmark against similar organizations to identify effective solutions and technologies that can be adopted. Uh, the most important, definitely, for every customer is the developing the budget. Establish a realistic budget that considers both initial implementation costs and long-term operational costs. Ensure that the budget aligns with the security objective. And uh, after that, definitely uh, exploring the integrated uh, solution. Investigate the uh, integrated security system that uh, combine physical and cyber measurement. Uh, those solutions can enhance overall effectiveness and streamline management. Uh, and definitely choosing the right partner to implement the uh, solution. Uh, and finally, which will be focusing on the training and awareness for uh, to prepare a training program for staff to ensure they understand the new security measure and protocol and cultivating a secure, aware culture in the uh, crucial of success. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'm looking at the the questions that have come in, and there's a few yeah. I would say practical questions, um, implementation level questions, and one of them from Oleg is: Are the microservices independent from one another? And what he means by that is there there's car recognition, facial recognition, building management. Are they independent instances, or do you aggregate data and uh, you know analyze you know the, the macro trends as well? I, I think um, in, in yeah to answer in, into one part iris recognition versus uh, uh, facial recognition it depends on the purpose and iris recognition you have two eyes you you analyze them you, to the biometric uh, uh, data actually that you say like iris recognition is is used where all the others are failing you know when when the faces are covered when uh, the by finger templates are difficult to read, or you don't want to have any touching uh, system, Iris is, is working there. It's a high level of security. Facial recognition is, 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 is brilliant, improved a, a lot in, in, in quality over the days. It's going very quick quickly, uh, uh, but it's also convenient and very convenient where sometimes Iris is seen as a more intrusive system. What is important is that you integrate that in your security uh, your platform, that it is not a standalone thing. Uh, it, it, it is fully uh, integrated from one security platform, doing the enrollment, making sure that you have the, all the data uh, available at all times. I think also the, the fact that it's a lot of the intelligence is at the edge. So, for instance, Raf mentioned face recognition readers, Irish recognition readers, and that data is generated at the reader. If I look at from a camera side, the AI that runs on there, that data is generated at the camera side. Where it all starts to bleat and blend is at the actual uh, server client situation but that data is in effect separate it is the uh, the client system so the software for the access the video and so on that starts to bring that together and then starts to make additional sense of it because yep um, the irish recognition that will go through to the um, the door controller it will let me through the door fine if, if i'm permitted the, the uh, AI on the camera will identify there's a red car in the car park. Fine. But when all of that data, and going back at the few slides that we were talking about, is brought to the central point, that's when I can get the added value from it. So there is the value from what this data being generated can do for me, 
but equally there is the added value of how I mine that data. And that is probably the latest thing in this industry is what we start to focus on is I have metadata from cameras. I have all of the uh, data from the access control system, the fire, the intrusion, the BMS. How do I bring it together? How do I make use of that to give me additional management information, people flow information, and so on? But these are all still operating independently, and I think that's the key. Okay, okay wonderful. Now, I'm just conscious of, of time. We've, um, we've kept pretty much everyone that's joined the call on for an hour, which I'm most impressed with. But um, what we typically do with these types of presentations is I always love to hear a summarizing point or a closing note from each of the presenters and i'd love to do the same for you three now typically you know what is the major challenge what's the summary of the session today and what does the future hold for this particular topic um and Stuart, you're on screen for me so i'd love to start with you with you okay and another great question and for me um the key point out of all of this is ask questions whether you're installing, integrating, designing, because all that glitters is not gold. We talked earlier about integrations, and I'm just going to use a BMS integration for a moment, BACnet. People think, ah, this has got BACnet, that has got BACnet, so they will talk. No, different types of BACnet, uh, different types of camera integrations, OMVIV, that common language, but different dialects. So my takeaway from this is that particularly at this level, and any critical infrastructure is proof of concept. Test things out. Um, dig deeper ordinarily than people might do because it's about managing expectations of the end user and not having to try and patch things up afterwards. Uh, so it is really all about asking questions, asking questions. What is the required outcome? And, yeah, question asking. You cannot ask enough questions at this particular level. Thank you, Stuart. And, and Raf, would you like to follow on from there? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, sure. Interoperability between systems, uh, use open standards where possible and test the system before implementation. But sure, go also with an integrator and a manufacturer that think long-term, mm -hmm. not short-term, quick wins, long-term planning, making sure that they, you have, uh, based on the history that the company build up, that you see that there is, is a future going forward. Yeah, embrace new technologies, but uh, implement it while it is uh, a worthwhile to do. Is mobile credentials efficient for data centers? Perhaps, perhaps not. For certain cases, yes or no, that assessment can be done together with, uh, with uh, your key integrator. We're using uh, artificial intelligence more and more to create efficiency. Sometimes you don't see that on a data sheet, but going deeper into the system, having a demonstration about uh, how security operations work, then you see in depth how performant the system is. So um, yeah, that is my takeaways. Thank you. And, and Joseph, the floor is yours to, to close. Yes, uh, in my opinion, I will start with the with the AI. I believe uh, with the advancement in the AI, I believe this will be the next actually supporting uh, uh, enhancing the threat detection and uh, uh, definitely enhancing the automated response, predictive analytics, reduce the false alarm, as well as resource optimization and real time uh, data analytics. So. I believe the AI will be having a effective role on the future of uh, enhancing the data center uh, implementation on the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, by the way, thank you to all three of you for your, your time and for presenting today and to the audience for participating in the session today as well. Um, one closing note from myself, if anyone wants to explore the, the websites for, for both of these organizations that have been on the call, please do. There's certainly more content information case studies that you'll find there. And of course, please feel free to reach out to Joseph Stewart and Raf offline. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to answer any questions as well. But um, thank you to everyone for joining the session today. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much, everybody.